back. You can survive one more hour. You'll get a, I don't know, you should get something. I don't know what it would be, but uh, <clears throat> what? Yeah, pizza. So the English Bible. And when we think about where we are with translation, uh, how do we know that those who translated our Bibles are uh, honest? They're not inserting their own doctrinal prejudices. Um, surely you've heard horror stories about some of that and that there's been uh, some people that have... Uh, purposely manipulated uh, a text in order to advance their own uh, religious belief or doctrine. <clears throat> we want to talk, though, a little bit of, of background and history that brings us to the, the discussion of the English Bible. Think about this. The Great Commission of Matthew 28 is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How do you do that without translation? You don't. It can't be done. It's obvious, even with the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that God intended that the word be translated into other languages. And so even when we go to the day of Pentecost, what happened on the day of Pentecost? Well, there was the language that was being, uh, the sermon that was being translated into several different languages. And the Bible is even more precise than that. Luke tells us in the very dialects of the people that were there. And so... We know that um, if someone from Alabama comes up here, we're going to know they're from Alabama because the dialect is different than, uh, well, that's what Acts 2 is saying. It wasn't just English, but the very dialects of English uh, by way of illustration. But my point is this. <clears throat> God wanted and assumed that his word was going to be translated into other languages. So that thought all by itself prov <clears throat> provides a level of comfort to me and hopefully to you as well that this is a part of God's plan and that it be translated. Now, if we go all the way back, though, to the beginning of translations, this is what's known as an ivory diptych. It's carvings on the side of an altar of an ancient uh, Roman church building, and when the Roman Empire fell, uh, wars were everywhere, learning was incredibly low. People were in survival modes. They didn't have time to go to school, and so, um, but they went to church, though, even though they, they couldn't read, and so the way that the message of the Bible was communicated was through these ivory diptychs, these carvings. And you can just Im imagine that you would have something about the size of this communion table that has these carvings that are carved in the front of it. And then people would come and they would sit around and then a story would be told uh, from the Bible while everybody is looking at a particular picture. Um, for example, if you look here, there's Lazarus, and Jesus is saying, Lazarus, come forth. And so imagine that on that particular day, the account of this uh, raising of someone from the dead is being, uh, being taught from the Gospel of John. Um, notice the six water pots there. Uh, so the turning of the water into wine, the miracle at the wedding of Cana in John chapter 2. Uh, you can just... Imagine uh, people, adults and children alike, looking at uh, that carving as they're um, hearing the story of that miracle. Um, this is uh, Jesus healing the centurion servant. There's the servant that's um, sick there. Um, up here on the top left is the, the feeding of the 5,000. You've got the, the bread that's there. 
Um, here's the paralyzed, uh, no, there's the paralyzed man. Take up your bed and walk, Jesus says. And then um, that one in the middle is the uh, healing of a blind man. Uh, so anyway, th th that's how people learn the Bible. They learned the Bible through uh, carvings like that. <clears throat> and then later on, you had these that were produced called medieval picture Bibles that, um, <clears throat> again, it had captions, as you can see, um, that people couldn't read. And so uh, they would look at the various pictures and people uh, were learning Bible stories uh, from these picture Bibles. The problem with these, and you can see the dating is a little bit later uh, than the ivory diptychs that I was just showing you, is it introduced some false doctrine. Um, and sometimes just false impressions. Uh, the furniture isn't accurate, the hairstyles, the clothing, uh, none of that is accurate to first century Jews in these medieval picture Bibles. And then <clears throat> on the top right, you've got a baby being baptized. Uh, well, infant baptism is not a New Testament practice. It was something that was introduced about 300 years after the time in the New Testament. And so there was always a danger or a possibility that some false doctrine could be uh, interjected in these um, various medieval picture Bibles. <clears throat> Jumping forward about 300 years, there was a man by the name of Beatty that um, was interested in doing some Bible translation. As you can see, he lived in the late 600s, early uh, 700s. And although his original work is uh, not has not survived, <clears throat> what he did and then what others have said uh, about what he did has, um, has been preserved. But he's noted as being one of the first guys to uh, really start translating things into, back then, what was known as English. But it's um, very different from our English today. How different? Well, jump forward another couple of hundred years, and here's a guy by the name of Cademan who um, put Bible stories into poetry. And let's, uh, uh, let's have a little fun with this. Um, Nebaioth gave thy forthren, they the fairin brothe. What on earth is that saying? Be not frightened thereat, though Pharaoh has brought. And then, Sword Bingendra Elora Unrim. Okay. Let me back up. <laughs> James, you ever have problems with this? There's a medieval picture Bible. There's BD. Okay, we're getting there. Sword wielders, vast troops. All right. Elim, Elim, Billy, Mithkin, Driften, Thurnmine, Hand, Dudagi, Thyssen, Dagli, and Giffen. To them all will the mighty Lord through my hand this very day recompense give. All right, it's not Bible translation, but it's telling the story of how the Egyptian soldiers chased after the Israelites into the Red Sea and the waters collapsed on them and they, they all perished in, in the water. <clears throat> well, um, so that's what was done, but that's English. <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem like it's English. Uh, but it is English, very ancient English. Then they had these things come along that you might be familiar with that are known as interlinears. Interlinears are simply where you've got a document that's in an ancient language, and then your language, you uh, write the translation of that right below it. <clears throat> Go
got a number of these that have been discovered. Um, and you can see the dating, um, the Lindenfar Gospels, the close of the 7th century up to the, the middle of the 11th century. There's a priest by the name of Aldred that wrote English in, in between the lines of that. I've got a couple of illustrations of what we're talking about. So you can see the, the manuscript writing, and then you can see what looks like scribbling uh, above that. Well, that's the Linden Far Gospel. Those are uh, translation of the Bible text. This is the Gospel of Mark. And um, so if you had a copy of this manuscript or uh, of this Bible, you had English translated above, uh, above it for you. Another example, and you can, you can see the, the, uh, the transliteration above it that's being written. <clears throat> and then the first independent English gospel is what is known as the Wessex gospel. Um, if you looked at that, Sudlese urade his son, his son, de son, and tata he saw some of his villain with vague. Well, <laughs> that's English. Doesn't sound like English, but it is. And then the Norman conquest. Wars are always game changers in a lot of different ways, including language. And that's certainly what has happened with uh, English. With the Norman conquest, it brought great changes to uh, English culture. Now you've got French mixed with spoken English. So that what we just looked at in the Wexit Gospels, even people that lived in the 1100s could not understand that. That's how much the language had changed in um, just about a uh, hundred years' time. Jump forward another 300 years to another very significant uh, man by the name of John Wycliffe. He was one that was a Catholic priest, but uh, as he studied his Bible, he began seeing that there were a lot of inconsistencies in Catholic doctrine and what the Bible actually said. <clears throat> he encouraged the people... Uh, to uh, study the Bible for themselves, to learn uh, where they could read the Bible, uh, encourage the preaching of the Bible to the people. Everything was in Latin and no one knew Latin. And so you'd go to church service and the, the church service would last uh, two, three, four hours and the whole thing was in Latin and you didn't understand any of it. Uh, well, so... Wycliffe is a guy that said, we need to start having our services in uh, the language that the people that come understand. Martin Luther, a little trivia, is the first one to really actually pull that off, though. And that's till 200 years from now. Uh, but Martin Luther is the first one uh, that actually used and preached German to people uh, in Germany. But... He translated the Bible into English in manuscript form, and this is uh, Wycliffe's translation. These things Jesus spake, and when he had cast his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour cometh, clarify thee, son, that the son to clarify thee. Okay, we're getting there. Now we're getting a little bit closer. Uh, we can make sense of that. Uh, well, that's the English of uh, 1400s. And then... Talk about game changers. We're talking about a lot of game changers in this seminar. But the Gutenberg Press, 1450, this was a game changer. Um, first book to be printed in the Gutenberg Press was the Latin uh, Bible. And then the Bible, uh, the Greek Bible, was printed uh, a little bit later, including this Complutensian polyglot, which I'll talk about in just a minute. This is the Gutenberg Press gives you an illustration of, of what it looked like. This board right here would slide back and forth, and it would slide out, and then you'd put a piece of paper on there, and then he would crank it, walk around this way, and it would press down on that, and then he would walk back, and it would lift up the slide, slide out, put a new sheet of paper, hang, out, hang up the old one and let it dry, slide a new one in there, and 
yeah, you got very proficient at that, and you're cranking them out uh, hundreds of pages per hour uh, of this Gutenberg press. This I have uh, a page <clears throat> from this press that I used to bring with my seminars, then I got to thinking, I don't want to lose that or have it damaged, so I just took pictures of it for you. <clears throat> but isn't that pretty? Uh, it's amazing um, how beautiful uh, what this press w was able to produce with the color and the clarity and all that. And so you can just imagine that the Bibles that were produced by this were uh, very treasured, but mass-produced. Everything, literally, prior to this 1450 date was handwritten. And now the Bible could be produced uh, with this printing press. I mentioned the Complutense and Polyglot. Um, this was the best study tool of its day. And... It was amazing. Uh, this is a page that's open to Deuteronomy 32. Amazing at what all uh, was there. You had Hebrew. Then you had the Latin Vulgate. Then you had the Septuagint, which is a uh, translation from Hebrew to Greek with a Latin interlinear. Chaldaic, Latin, and then you had um, Hebrew and Chaldaic roots on the side. Pretty, pretty impressive study tool. And something like this could only be produced because of, of the, um, the Gutenberg press. There were 600 of these that were produced. There are only two known to exist. Now, someone was telling me at break that they discovered one of the uh, ancient original copies of an English Bible in grandma's attic. If you happen to have a Complutense and polyglot in your attic or something, you, now would be a good time to pull it out. It's worth millions of dollars. Erasmus was the guy that printed, that produced the first Greek text it's called the Texas Receptus, which means the text received by all. And um, it uh, was the text that everyone was able to use uh, for hundreds of years and, years. and it was the Greek text that the King James used in 1611. You can see that it came out about seven, 70 years prior to the King James. And then some major changes were happening, happening both religiously and politically, uh, with which a period that we know of as um, the Great Reformation. Um, it's called the Reformation because guys like Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and, and Melanchthon, they're just wanting to fix the Roman Catholic Church. They're not wanting to leave it. They just have found some things that needed to be changed. And so Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses on the, uh, the door of a, of a, a Catholic church in Wittenberg. Um, well, that started uh, him learning and everybody else learning that uh, the Catholic church isn't going to change. They have no interest uh, in changing anything. And so that then led to the formation of Protestantism, protesting uh, against uh, the, the Catholic Church, but that also led to a number of things. One is uh, preaching the word to people became central in the churches. Um, the Catholic Church realized in a hurry they were losing out big time because you could either go to a Catholic Church for four hours and listen to uh, a Mass in Latin, which you didn't understand, or you could go to this Protestant church that was going to be in English. Duh, I mean, where are you going to go? Obviously, we're going to go over here. And besides, I've always kind of wanted to hear the Bible, and they're preaching the Bible over there. Then the Catholic Church says they're preaching the Bible, but it's in Latin, and I don't understand it anyway. So um, it really <clears throat> impacted attendance in the Catholic churches. 
And then a guy by the name of William Tyndale came on the scene about this time. He was one that uh, had come to believe that the Bible needed to be translated uh, into the language of the common man. And Tyndale uh, was doing this at a period of time in which the Catholic authorities had made it unlawful for people to translate the Bible. Now, I don't know if, if that shocks you as much as it does me, but that the fact that there was actually a period of time when it was illegal to translate the Bible. One time, Tyndale was having a conversation with someone that was very high up in the Roman Catholic Church, and he was sharing with him his desire to translate the Bible into the language of the common people. And this high Catholic official said, it's more important that the people have the Pope's laws than God's laws. To which Tyndale replied, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life very many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plow to know more of the scripture than you do. So he set himself with the task of translating the Bible into English and uh, at, at great personal cost. How great. They burned his body on the stake. His crime? Translating the Bible in English. His last words as the fires were consuming his body was, O oh Lord, open thou the king of England's eyes. And he was hoping the king of England would trump the, the authority of the Catholic Church and allow the translation of the Bible to be something that is done freely. But here is a man who actually joins a list of other men that we haven't talked about, like uh, Wycliffe and John Huss and some others, who lost their lives for what crime? For the crime of translating the Bible into the language of the common tongue. But that's what happened with William Tyndale. Eventually, other Bibles were produced, and they, there was always a political slant to uh, some of these. This Bible front piece is very telling uh, because of what all of these various captions uh, are, are saying, um, because each one of them is an indication of how the Bible belongs in the hands of the people. So a political statement, if you will, is being made even by... Um, those <coughs> captions on the side and it's like Mark 16 go into all the world and preach the gospel or it's Ezra over here that's uh, given the law to the people explaining to them what it says um, Jesus given the great commission or Moses given the, um, the word of God to the people the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 the great commission uh, so the point is of this Bible is that the Bible is a document that has always been God's intention, be that which uh, people have. This was called the Great Bible because it was huge, <clears throat> but it also was one that was very telling because it had a picture on the front piece of King King Henry, King Henry the Eighth, I am, I am, and he liked it when he saw the picture of himself on the front of the Bible. He thought that was pretty cool. And then, if you go to the bottom of that page, it's got all the people that are saying "Vivet Rex, Vivet Rex, Long Live the King." Well, he liked that too, so he gave uh, official permission for this Bible to be produced, and it was the first time. So. Um, it, they, did, they, they took a political risk by putting the king on the front of it. He liked it. He sanctioned it. And um, that allowed the production of that Bible. <clears throat> the Geneva Bible, which came out in 1536, was the first to use verse numbers. You say, wait a minute. 1536? Yeah. 
the first to use verse numbers. As a matter of fact, did you know that there was a, a, a professor at the University of Paris that was the first to divide the Bible into chapters? And that was in 1272, I think it was. Peter Langton was his name. And he divided the Bible up into chapters, and it stayed that way for another 300 years, approximately. And then the Geneva Bible said, hey, if we're going to divide it up into chapters, why don't we divide it up into verses? And so all of our Bibles today are divided into chapter and verses, but it's a relatively new, uh, new phenomenon. But certainly know this, not inspired, the dividing of the chapters and the verses are, are done by men. And so uh, sometimes they do a good job and sometimes eh, not so good. The joke is, and I don't, I actually don't think it's a joke, is that Peter Langton um, lived several, several hours away from the University of Paris, and he would just get his, uh, he was on a, uh, a cart and his horse, and the horse knew how to get there, and so he's in on the horse dividing the Bible up into chapters. And whenever you come to a really bad chapter break, that's when the horse hit a bump and he, he marked, it, marked it in the wrong spot. So that may be true. I don't know. The Council of Trent, we mentioned this earlier, convened in 1546. And the reason that it was convened in the first place was because all of this Bible translating stuff was happening, and the Catholic Church was losing its uh, vice grip on the people. And so they, in this council, first of all, declared that you had to accept the Apocrypha or be anathema from God and from the church. Remember the Deuterocanonical books, the Apocrypha books that we talked about in the last session. Well, now we know why it took till 1546 before um, there was an official proclamation is the Catholics were hoping to indict the Protestant Bibles because the Protestant Bibles didn't have those 11 books. And they're saying, see, they don't want you to have the full word of God. <clears throat> and then the second thing that they decided at this council was to make their own translation. And so the, the Douay Reims version was the Roman response or the Roman Catholic response to all of these Bibles, the Coverdale Bible, the Tyndale Bible, the Wycliffe Bible, uh, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible uh, that had come out um, within the last hundred years prior to this. Depending on who was on the throne, depending on whether the church would even have a Bible. When Queen Mary was on the throne, uh, she was pro-Catholic and required all Bibles to be removed from churches. When Elizabeth was on the throne, she was pro-Protestant and she decreed that all Bibles could be brought back into the churches. They were put on places and chained uh, to keep them from being stolen. And history records that the churches when the Bibles were finally brought back, would allow you 15 minutes to read the Bible with your own eyes. And so there were lines that would form for hundreds of yards for your 15 minutes to read the Bible. In inclement weather, would you stand outside in the heat for hours to read the Bible with your own eyes for 15 minutes? They did. In bad weather? For 15 They did. That's the kind of, of age that they're in, and we think how unbelievably blessed. Maybe we don't think. That's, maybe that's a problem. Uh, how unbel un unbelievably blessed we are. I don't know if you've ever thought this. I have because I do this seminar. How many Bibles do you have in your house? Well, I was curious to know, and so I started going room to room, looking at my library, looking at what Kathy had and what my daughter had and everything. 36 Bibles in my house. 
not counting electronic, just 36. There were people that died so someone could have one. And here we are with Bibles beautifully bound, all 66 books. Um, you can go to a store and you can buy it for five bucks. We are unbelievably blessed at this age right now. But yet, send in hours to, to be able to read it for 15 minutes. And yet, we'll have something that will sit on a shelf or tabletop for hours and days and never get opened. We think about people like Tyndale and others that died so that we could have a Bible for ourselves. It's an amazing story, and sometimes it reflects negatively upon us on uh, our being spoiled and maybe uh, our failure to really appreciate the value of the Word of God, but they certainly did, so much so that they were uh, willing to lose their life just so it could be translated uh, into English. King James VI of Scotland was tired of all of the different Bibles, including the Catholic Bible and all those others, the Bishop, the Coverdale, the Tyndale, the Great, and all that I mentioned a minute ago, that he wanted there to be one Bible that everybody could use. So from 1604 to 1611, he got together 47 scholars that labored under the Royal Commission. That meant they got paid handsomely for their work uh, to translate the Bible into the common tongue of the English people. And so, hence, in 1611, um, the King James Bible was produced. When we look at all of the various Bibles, and these are all the major ones today, they all fall on somewhat of a timeline uh, not a timeline, but a, a scale from word for word, thought for thought, to paraphrase. Um, on this particular chart, they've got the New American Standard as um, the most literal word for word translation. King James, New King James, and ESV are a little bit right of that. Uh, the New Revised Standard and the New American Bible, the NIV the New Living uh, Bible, and then the, um, the uh, NJB is the um, uh, Jerusalem Bible, uh, and so on, on to the paraphrase, including the um, Living Bible paraphrase, <clears throat> and so on. Um, yeah, there it is right there, the Jerusalem Bible. Let's talk quickly about um, some of these. How many in here use the King James as your major? Not that you. I'm not asking what Bibles you have, what translations, but what is your major study Bible? Anybody use King James as your major study Bible? Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. So, um, <clears throat> the King James does have some strengths. It does contain Old English. A lot of people like that. I memorized as a kid uh, out of the King James, and it stuck in my brain. Uh, just beautiful language. Reliable and dependable. Um, still remains one of the most popular. It does have some weaknesses, though. 800 Old English words. They don't mean today what they meant in 1611. 800, that's a lot. Um, use the old Greek text, the Texas Receptus. Um, this is the text that modern translations use. Like I said, it's an eclectic text. It's using all the manuscript witnesses. Um, the King James and the New King James are based upon the Erasmus Texas Receptus. All Erasmus had was about 10 late manuscripts. He did not have anywhere close to what we have today. Does have some incorrect translations. (laughs) 
it translates the word Hades, which actually is a Greek word for hell. Not, hell, hell and Hades are not the same place. Um, it translated bishop. Well, bishop was a word that meant a man that was over several churches. There is no such position in the New Testament church, in the, uh, in the Bible. And so the King James is fostering a, a Catholic uh, idea by using the word bishop. Easter, there is no such thing uh, in the Bible, but they translated Acts 12.4 uh, and put the word Easter in there. So <clears throat> it's got some problems. A lot of people don't know this, including even those that use the King, the King James, is that the 47 men that made the King James uh, put together a little booklet, what they call the translator, translators to the reader. And they, they have some very insightful things about the King James uh, Bible that they just translated. Um, man, oh man. They said, for example, that there needs to be translation and readiness. Um, they didn't see their translation as being the one for all time, but that as language change and, and time changes, new translations need to come about. They said it needs to be in a tongue that people understand. Language constantly changes. And so um, translations need to be updated. Never even move my finger off the button. Come on. Okay. Anybody use the ASV as your major translation? All right. We're not going to spend time with that then since I didn't see any hands. Revised Standard, anybody use the RSV? Okay. Came out in 1946. The problem... 1947, Dead Sea Scrolls discovered. That was super bad timing. <laughs> New American Standard. Anybody use the NAS? All right, got a several of uh, those. Came out in 1963, very conservative. You can see on that one uh, spectrum that it was considered to be the most uh, literal uh, translation. I don't agree with that. I think the American Standard is even more literal than the New American Standard, but still, um, it took advantage of recent discoveries. Those of you that use the NAS need to know that it does have some premillennial preferences, mainly in its uh, uh, page headings and in its cross-references. So not in the translation itself. The translation itself is fine, um, but it's got some preferences and some of those other things. Good overall translation, does have some inconsistencies. <clears throat> it, all right, NIV. All right, several, it came out in 1978. 110 uh, top scholars were involved in the NIV, including two from the Church of Christ were a part of the NIV. It attempted to provide ease in reading and comprehension. It had, for 1978, the most solid uh, textual base. Generally conservative, but here's the problem, those of you that raise your hand with the NIV, is it's a paraphrase in many places. What does that mean? That meant that these guys decided that they were not going to translate the words. They were just going to tell you what they think is being said. That's not a good practice. Um, that's no longer a translation. Um, that's a paraphrase. We need for our translators just to translate and then leave the interpretation to us. Uh, just translate what it says. Well, the NIV uh, violated that uh, policy in a number of places. It is currently the best-selling translation. <clears throat> They even admitted they were seeking more than a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, they saw that as a good thing, but it's not a good thing. Um, so you've got to be careful. All right, there are some guys that are very critical of the 
translating philosophy of the NIV, which um, we're not going to spend time looking at that. <clears throat> All right, New King James. All right, got several. They used New King James, came out in 1979. Corrected, you know, we, I mentioned that there are 800 words in the King James that um, no longer mean today what they meant in 1611. Well, the New King James corrected most of those, uh, so that's a good thing. <clears throat> it kept the same textual base. That's not a good thing. With all of the manuscript discoveries that have been made since 1611, when the Texas Receptus was uh, made by Erasmus, um, you would think that they, uh, they would have deferred to um, the, the modern Greek text that uses all of those manuscript discoveries, um, but they didn't, and I, I think that's unfortunate. It is a good translation. One of the things I like about the New King James is that they did a better job of consistently translating uh, the same word the same way whether it's Hebrew or Greek, um, by way of illustration, the New American Standard, uh, there's a Greek word in 1 Peter, anastrophe, uh, is a word that means behavior. Well, the New American Standard translated that five different ways. The same word. You're, there's no way you're ever going to know that Peter keeps hammering that one word, anastrophe, uh, by looking at some of these translations. But the, King, the new King James uh, does a better job, but stuff like that. Does have some problems, though. It did keep some outdated words like perdition. We don't use that word anymore. They should have come up with a better. It did repeat some passages that I talked about, textual variants. Um, the best manuscripts, the oldest manuscripts that we have of Luke, uh, the book of Acts, do not have the eunuch making that confession. It's not a genuine passage. But the New King James uh, kept it. Uh, they kept an, another questionable reading in 1 John chapter 5, which um, they, they shouldn't have done. So if you're ever in Bible class and uh, somebody has some, some words that your Bible doesn't have, that's why. Now, fortunately, there are not many of these. As I mentioned, 99.5% uh, pure. There are still a couple of minor passages like the Eunice Confession, like the passage in 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Um, they're not major doctrinal things. There are no major doctrinal things. Uh, and so don't let that rock your world. Uh, scholars are saying as we discover more manuscripts, uh, we're going to get to 100% pure, and um, so it's, uh, it's a work in progress, uh, but we are progressing. ESV, anybody use the English Standard Version? All right, came out in 2001. It is mainly a reproduction of the RSV. Now, when I asked about the RSV, nobody raised their hand. Um, but those of you that are using the ESV, you're using the RSV. 90%, uh, percent, um, 90 to 95% the same. Um, <clears throat> it did make one major change, though. Um, the RSV uh, translated, Behold, a virgin will be with child. The RSV translated it maiden. Well, the ESV brought that back to virgin and... Um, Translating that maiden pretty much killed the RSV. Uh, according to them, they're attempting to be what they call essentially literal. Overall, it is a good translation. It does have some problems. It completely changes Malachi 2.16, if you notice that. Um, we, God hates divorce, is what the verse says. Um, but in the ESV, it's... Uh, not God hating divorce at all, but it's uh, a man hates and divorces his wife. Um, Matthew 16, 18 says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's been proven for so long that the word is Hades. It's not hell. Why the ESV kept it hell, I don't know. 
Um, been some awkward uh, verses, but nevertheless, uh, a good translation. People get um, a little bit, uh, it rocks their world a little bit, but get used to it. Um, there are translations that are in the hopper right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, the New American Standard just came out uh, with a, a, their third major uh, rendition. What I have here is New American Standard, 1963. But then they came out with the 95 update, which I really like. But now they've come up with what they call the NAS 20. Um, and um, so uh, there's a new, Amer new, it's called the UASV, the Updated American Standard Version. Have you seen that, Steve? Um, you can get it on Logos for like five bucks. It's uh, if you have Logos Bible software, but um, <clears throat> they um, uh, so they're trying to bring back the uh, American Standard. And have, anyway, my point is this: about fifty years ago, the whoever it is that does the New York bestseller list got tired of the Bible always being number one. And they recognized the Bible was always going to be number one. And so they decided they were no longer going to include it on their bestseller list. And so whatever year that was, the Bible was dropped. But it still is the number one bestseller in the world. And has been uh, for since printing. That being the case, there is a lot of money to be made with Bible translations. And so they're going to keep producing new Bibles with the hope that um, they can produce the next big thing, uh, the next major Bible that everybody will buy. I mentioned that the NIV is the number one uh, selling Bible. Uh, well, those people that were involved in the NIV have made themselves very, very rich uh, by coming up with a Bible translation that ends up being the, the number one uh, best-selling Bible. So if you can produce the next big thing, um, then you'll become very very uh, wealthy because of that. Um, so some people like it. Some people don't like <clears throat> new translations. So let me offer some suggestions. Use only major translations. Do not use a translation that's done only by one, uh, one person. Uh, if you ever do some reading on uh, translations, you see that they have committees. So you've got a passage that's got several eyes on it, uh, and they uh, do a lot of work on those passages. There's a lot of exchange uh, <clears throat> on those passages, and um, uh, that's the best way. Uh, checks and balances is what happens with that. Second, use all the translations you can put your hands on. Don't use uh, just one. Now, granted, you're going to have one major Bible that you use, that you bring to church and so on. But in your own study, um, use one of those parallel Bibles that's got four translations uh, side by side. Um, any bookstore is going to have those. Uh, you can get them for free online, um, but they're called parallel Bibles. And... Um, Typically, they'll have uh, the King James, uh, another major translation, and then a paraphrase. And uh, So don't rely on just one. Expose yourself to as many uh, different translations as you can. Also recognize all translations have problems. There is no such thing as a perfect translation. And so, you know, we, we get bent out of shape that, you know, this translation uh, translated that wrong. Well, I, I could show you something wrong with every translation that's out there. But truth can be learned uh, f from these translations, and, and that's uh, the important part. I get asked lots of why questions. Maybe... As we were going through this, you even had some. Uh, why, didn't, why did God do it this way? Uh, why didn't he preserve the originals? 
why do we not have more ancient manuscripts? I guess 36,000 is just not enough. I don't know. Um, why do we not have 100% accuracy? 99.5 is, that's pretty good though. That's, that's still pretty close. Why are there still textual problems? Well, um, lots of why questions. But you know, and I, and I don't know the answer uh, to all of those and why God did it um, the way he did it. But I do know that God does want us to operate on a level of faith. And if somebody is looking for a reason to not uh, believe the Bible, they can say, well, it's only 99.5% accurate. Or, you know, we don't have enough manuscripts. Or we, if, if they're really looking for a way out, you could say God's provided them a way out. And that's exactly what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That if you don't have a love for the truth, so as to be saved, God will send, Paul says, a deluding influence so that you might believe what is false. That's a tough passage. But it does say that God will send a deluding influence that someone will believe what's false. Why? Because they don't love the truth. There, there are people out there, they don't want to know the truth about the Bible, and so they'll look for any excuse that they can to believe uh, something else. So what have we learned in our time today? The Bible's claim to be from God is justifiable. It's not just a claim. It's not just words, but it's words that uh, are justified words, are provable words. <clears throat> we've learned that we've got the right 66 books and that those who say that there are missing books, they're not uh, being true to the evidence, those who say that there are some books that got in that shouldn't do not understand how the books became a, a part of the Bible in the first place. We got the right books, uh, the right 66 books. We've also learned that the Bible was accurately copied through the centuries. And you know, there's something else <clears throat> that I'll throw in real quick here. They said that the Bible has been hopelessly corrupted through centuries of copying and recopying. But there are some people that have said, time out on that. Because are we really talking about centuries of copying and recopying? Now, consider this. The Dead Sea Scrolls were papyrus. They were... 250 B.C. We discovered them in 1947. And they were in pristine condition. Papyrus. Now granted, it was in a dry climate and they were in jars and they weren't touched for 2,000 years. But they still survived. So it's possible for even papyrus to survive. Second, are the big three, the Vaticanus, the Alexandrinus, and the Sinaiticus, are all copies of all 66 books of the Bible bound together in one volume. All of them are 4th century. So middle 350 to 375 date for all three of those. But what was used to make those three? Well, obviously, they had some manuscripts that were available that made the Vaticanus and the Alexandrinus. Okay, what generation were those? Could it be they were actually second generation uh, copies? We don't know, but no one can prove otherwise. And so rather than it being hundreds of years and literally hundreds of copies, it could be that the Alexandrinus is a second generation or a third generation Bible. So we're not talking about thousands of copies and recopies. Uh, we could only be talking potentially of two or three uh, copies. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but that's some of the new stuff that's coming, uh, coming out. But one thing that we have learned is the Bible 
was accurately copied, copied by people that believed it was inspired, that loved it, and they did their very best to make sure that they were copying it accurately. Fourth, we've learned that our English translations are dependable and reliable. Granted, all English translations have some mistakes. I've said that several times. But I bring up an extra point, which you may or may not have thought about. Jesus used a translation. Did you know that? He quoted from the Septuagint, the LXX. And remember, the Septuagint was a translation from Hebrew into Greek. Jesus, when he quoted Scripture, he quoted the Septuagint. And the apostles, they quoted from the Septuagint. And you know what? There are people today, scholars that have said, and the Septuagint wasn't a particularly good translation. Well, Jesus, it was good enough for Jesus. It was good enough for the apostles. And so if Jesus himself and the inspired apostles of Christ, if they could use a translation, I think we're okay uh, using a translation as well. So there's no legitimate reason to not believe in the Bible, study the Bible, and obey the Bible. We've looked at these criticisms. Uh, we've, uh, we've dealt with some of the charges against the Bible, and they just don't stand up. The, the bottom line is we got the right books. It was accurately copied. It's been well translated, and now it's on us. There's no reason uh, to not uh, be diligent in our study and our obedience of the Bible. As Jesus said in his prayer to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. That's how uh, we are going to be sanctified, is the truth of God's word. So, All right. Do we have any questions? had a couple that were given to me. What Bible translation do you use? I use the New American Standard. Um, and um, if <clears throat> those of you that are using the NIV, um, I really do recommend that you move away from that. Um, because it's not a translation, it's more of a paraphrase. And um, uh, I think there are, are better options out there uh, than the NIV. So um, just my personal opinion, uh, but if you were going to buy a, a new translation, uh, I probably would go with something like the the ESV uh, or maybe the ninety five the New American Standard ninety five update. Uh, I would probably go uh, with uh, with one of those. Um, let me see. Some of these I already answered, so. What date was the Bible actually put together to become one book? Who put it together and translated it? All right. Uh, somewhere in the late second century is the, the best evidence documentation we have. Right around 175, um, there's evidence of all 27 books. All 27 books are, are being uh, identified by uh, various writers. Now, remember, the, the Catholic Council of Carthage is 200 years after that, when they're claiming to have established the canon, uh, but the canon was established uh, in the, the late 100s. Uh, so... That's, um, that's the best evidence that we have uh, on answering that. So, All right, any other questions? Yes. Okay, so when do we think John, the Apostle John died? And then what, what time frame does Polycarp arrive? Uh, Polycarp is around 125. Um, and uh, that's typically a, a date that's toward the end of his life, considered to be end of his life. John, uh, typically people say the gospel was written 90, the epistles were written 
95, 96, and Revelation was written 96 uh, AD. So that might be off by two or three years, but I think 90s for all of John's writings. Uh, and then Polycarp as a disciple uh, would be not long after that. So. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is Tertullian, who lived at 175, um, says that miracles had ceased. And I, I find that interesting that because if you think, let's say John lived in 96 AD and he laid his hands on uh, an 18 year old and he got the power of working miracles. Well, say that 18 year old himself lived to be 90. Now you've got the potential of someone that could work miracles living late into the second century. But by the time you get to 175, Tertullian says there are no more, uh, which is confirmation of what the Bible says about miracles um, ceasing. So. Yeah, um, let me split that into, into two answers. First of all, King James did not believe in immersion. And so when the translators were coming to passages that had the Greek word baptizo, King James said, you're not going to translate that immersion. And they said, it means immersion. That's what the word means. But by then, you know, you had sprinkling and infant baptism. And so the only resolution the translators could come up with was to transliterate the word. Did you know that the word baptism did not exist in 1610? There was no such word. But when the translators in 1611 got to the Greek word baptizo, they wanted to translate it immersion. That's what the word meant. King James said no. He was paying their salaries. And so they transliterated it, hence the creation of the word baptism. And now we've seen what's happened. And so, Jimmy, you look at what, what we've got going on. If, and there are people that continue to think they follow the Bible by being sprinkled or being poured or whatever, when if... The word that Peter said, repent and be immersed. Every one of you, that's, that's a, a big deal. Now, on the other side of that, um, I, I've studied with people with uh, Mormon translation, um, the New World translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and I think you can teach the truth. Uh, even with some of these translations that are done by uh, denominations like those. Uh, so I, I think it's possible with any translation that you can teach someone the truth. So. How old was Tertullian when he said the miracles have ceased? And then my reason I'm asking is because was he old enough to have witnessed miracles in his lifetime? Yeah. Don't I don't know. They typically have his death around 210. So if he said in 175, you know, lived another 40 years plus after that. But yeah. are all your Bibles that you have, are they like Catholic or Orthodox? They are. Yeah. I I think I have a copy of just about every major translation there is. Um so I have a Catholic Bible, I've got uh, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness Bibles, uh, and then uh, all of the trans, you know, King James, New King James, Revised Standard, all of those. So I've got one of just about everything. All right. Thank you. It's been a long day. 
uh, but you've uh, you've endured. I didn't hear any snoring, and I appreciate that. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much for coming, Lance. I'll turn it over to you then. I'm going to just lead us in a closing prayer, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. Dear Father in heaven, it was good good to be here today. Thank you for uh, allowing us, your, your, your faithful servants, to, uh, again, see the work of your hand, to see that you have protected the truth from the beginning. Father, thank you for the fact that we live in a country and in a time where we have access freely, get freely allowed to us to read your word at any time. And we pray that we utilize that because that might not be the case. Uh, moving forward, help us to uh, allow us to soak every aspect of our life, to uh, shine the light, to reflect your son, and to spread the, the message of truth uh, throughout all the world. God, thank you again for your love for us. Thank you for communicating to us, because we, of course, are insignificant, and you are so great, but the fact that you uh, have chosen to share with us your will for us is, is truly amazing, and we are uh, blessed and humbled by that. Thank you again for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.